Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lucy Hebbins and I'm the, uh, a member of the advisory board of Fintech B2B Marketing. So over the next 60 minutes we're going to be um, taking a look at some of the digital trends, emerging technologies and, and some of those investor priorities that are impacting the wealth and asset management industry. And before we kick off, just a few quick um, housekeeping items. So firstly, the format of today's um, webinar is panel discussion. Uh, so I'm going to be moderating a hopefully very lively debate with, with some fantastic industry experts. Um, secondly, we'd love to hear from you. So we've allowed plenty of time for questions. So please feel free to type them in and we will um, do our best to draw them into the conversation. Um, we've got some super interesting resources available for you. So you can find those um, in the resources tab, which is just underneath your webinar screen. Um, and then finally, a recorded version of this webinar will be available um, on Bright Talk and sent to your inbox after we've finished. Um, so before we start with the panel discussion, I just wanted to take a minute to um, set the scene and give a little bit of background as to, as to why we're here having this discussion. So um, I'm gonna flip the slides on for a minute. Get that with me. There we go. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, my name is Lucy Heaven, so I sit on the advisory board for FinTech B2B Marketing. So if you're new to the community, we launched um, back in 2020, um, and our vision is really to bring together marketers from the financial services firms and from the tech providers, and really try and um, simplify um, a lot of those complexities of marketing um, in, in the FinTech world that we're in. So it's a really, really fantastic community, and to be honest with you, one that I wish was around when I first started out in, in my marketing career all those years ago. Um, if you're interested in joining the community, um, our standard membership is free, but if you want to benefit from some of those um, extra special content and mentorship and some other really great um, benefits, then a premium membership is available at a cost. So please look at our website, fintechb2bmarketing.com, uh, if you want more information. So earlier this year, Fintech B2B Marketing engaged with um, ESI Thought Labs. Um, we heard about this really fantastic research project that was taking place into um, the technological change that was going on in wealth and asset management industry. And it really struck a chord with me. You know, we're all really familiar with the phrase, the pace of change will never be this slow again. And so much has changed over the last 18 months in wealth and asset management. And it's really scary to think that, you know, at the moment that phrase could never be more true, right? Um, you know, we knew instantly that we really wanted to support this this fantastic research project, and, and this panel discussion discussion today is us demonstrating that support and bringing all of these world class experts to you uh, to provide their views. So I'm going to hand over now to Lou, who's going to um, tell you a little bit more about the research project before we kick off the panel discussion. Okay, well, thank you, Lucy. This is Lou Chelly. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of ESI Thought Lab. Pleasure to be here today. Um, as, as Lucy mentioned, we're launching a major study on Wealth and Asset Management 4.0, and we are going to be talking about some of the key trends that uh, we will be investigating as part of this study. Uh, just a little background in ESI Thought Lab, we're a thought leadership research firm uh, that sits at the intersection of technology and business and financial markets. We specialize in digital transformation of, of financial institutions, uh, and we do uh, our studies on a regular basis, which will be made um, available to the community um, with our compliments. So the study is um, sponsored by some of the folks that are on the line and, and others, so Deloitte, FIS, uh, Salesforce, uh, Publicist, Sapient, and you can see the others on, on my screen, HCL and Refinitiv and Appway and eToro, LexisNexis, Risk Solutions, TCC, RecordShore. We work with media partners like FinTech Marketing, but also others, uh, and also associations such as PIMFA out of the UK and, and, and IF Irish Funds. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of good organizations are supporting this initiative just to set the scene for today's conversation, uh, we see uh, the rise of Wealth Management 4.0, and that has been accelerated by the pandemic. And, and our study is looking at really eight key megatrends. The first one is that digital becomes the norm, and lots of the organizations that we're talking to are, uh, have told us that they are speeding up digital transformation as a result of the pandemic. And in fact, um, 
you know, over well over half have even said they're they're adopting uh, emerging technologies like AI and blockchain and and cloud and edge computing. So uh, a lot is happening very quickly. Uh, at the same time, investors are resetting their expectations. I would say that uh, some of the old ways of thinking about investors are no longer true, and you need to really take a hyper personalized. A point of view when you think about investors and their needs. The future of work is definitely now, and that's another major trend that we will pick up today. Uh, because when you think about it, uh, the study that we, we we just did a pulse survey of financial institutions, and um, and what they told us is that they are going to be making great progress in working from home and more remotely. And we we did this study of a lot of different industries, but financial services in particular are moving more to a hybrid model because of the nature of their business, which is based mostly informational. Uh, firms, as a result, are rethinking their growth plans, and which is very important because there's a lot of competition going on and a lot of change. And so we have um, interviewed fintechs that are trying to go upstream and incumbents that are going downstream, and they're meeting in the middle. So we, we, we probably will get into some of that perhaps today. Social values are driving decision-making, we have to say, this shift to wealth management 4.0 is not just about digital transformation. It's also about the generational transfer. Uh, it's also about social values changing and the need for ESG investments and a, and a more compassionate form of capitalism that we see on the horizon. Value propositions have been were morphing even before the pandemic, but I think people really are re-examining where they get value and, uh, and they're expecting more transparency, and particularly as millennials move into the market, uh, that is on their mind as they move into using fintechs and, and, and online discount online trading um, platforms. The, the playing field is actually changing as we speak. We are even looking at broad changes on you know, platform companies and how they may be um, the same model that work for retail, maybe moving into the financial uh, Arena and Gold, Goldman Sachs, for example, has has announced that it's 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 in a platform model. For example, one of our other clients, UBS, the same. And then there's of course the regulatory landscape that's out there with more pressures uh, on uh, on on organizations and taxes even changing, particularly in our country of of the U.S. So those are some of the the broad shifts that are going to be. Uh, provide some context to our discussion today. You know, I'm, uh, I've been in this business long enough to have seen the transition of wealth management through many stages, even in the first part of the century when my grandfather came from Sicily and started to invest his money in the stock market. It's moved on since then. And we're moving into what I call wealth management 4.0, where, you know, you have the rise of this digital first socially minded world accompanied by demographic change, which is in reinventing the industry and very, very fast, much faster than people were expecting. So the study that we will be doing is a survey of 2,500 investors across all wealth levels and age levels and demographics to find out exactly how they are changing their strategies, behaviors, and needs as a result of the pandemic. And we're also looking at 500 wealth management firms to find out how they are responding. And, and what the future will look like. We'll, that study will include gap analysis, interviews with experts like some of the ones on the panel today. It's gonna to be ongoing webinars like this one. We'll have eBooks, think pieces, infographics. There'll be a microsite, a lot of great content. To follow this, this is a moving target and, uh, and it's, it's important to watch it um, and how it, it progresses over the months ahead. If you need any information on the study and want to get more involved, you can reach out this, this, uh, to, to any of us at Thought Lab. And there will be upcoming webinars. Uh, the next one will be September 9th, where we will dig deeper into the social regulatory issues. And then October 14th, you should mark on your calendars. That's when we launch the whole uh, key findings of our, our study and and um, and get you some of this information that people have been waiting for. So with that, I'm going to turn things back to Lucy. That's great. Thanks, Lou. Super interesting. Um, okay, let's uh, let's get to the good stuff then. Um, so I'm super excited to have an amazing panel of experts here with me today. So I'm going to turn off the slide so you can see the gorgeous faces. 
There we go. <laughs> and, um, some gorgeous faces. <laughs> um, so I'm going to introduce you to these, uh, all these gorgeous people are going to introduce themselves actually. So I'm going to ask um, everyone just to give a very quick introduction just so we, the audience knows who you are and, and your name. Um, so um, yeah, Corey, do you want to go first? Sure. Hi, uh, Corey Habercorn. I am with Salesforce. Uh, I'm an industry advisor for Salesforce focusing on wealth and asset management. Um, I talk to wealth and asset management firms all over the globe. Um, so I have a good understanding of, of what they're asking of us. Um, and then, of course, able to share about what industry trends are happening um, just based on soaking in all that information from all these wealth wealth firms from um, all over the place. It's great to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. David. Lucy, thank you for having me. Uh, Dave Donovan, I'm the president with Google Sapien. Google Sapien is a digital consulting firm. We uh, work with Fortune 500 companies to help them unlock enterprise value through uh, emerging technology and solutions. We work with all the major global banks in the world, as well as all the big, uh, all the all the global asset managers and, and fintechs. Great, thank you, Chantal. Hey, thanks. Um, I'm Chantel Scheip. I'm a Senior Vice President, Director of Strategic Planning uh, here at FIS in the Wealth and Retirement Division. I've uh, been in the financial services industry for a little more than 23 years. Uh, really been focused on building strategies and solutions, you know, that really elevate brands and kind of strengthen and deepen those relationships we have with our clients and our partners. Uh, proud to be a part of FIS for the last 16 years. Um, Bright Fortune 500 company and really excited to uh, share some of our insights with this group today. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And Lou, I think they, they've heard from us. So um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll crack on with the discussion. So, um, okay, so I think about about six months into the pandemic, um, I just wanted to mention this, about six months into the pandemic, I think it was last year, I read this super interesting article and it said, the winds of 2020 won't be the ones that finished as close to their original plans as possible. Um, the winners will be the ones that tore up the original plans and, and made new ones, which I thought was super interesting. Um, so I think, you know, what I'd like to hear from you guys actually is what lessons do you think that wealth managers learn um, during the pandemic um, and how are they using those learnings to really shape the, their future approaches? Um, David, do you want to kick off first? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, we, we actually believe that um, all consumers uh, expect a frictionless experience in all in any brand that they that they um, interact with. And we've seen brands like Apple and Amazon and Netflix that are outside of financial services and, and the seamless experience those consu those uh, those consumers have had with those brands. They expect that same experience with all the brands that they uh, that they interact with, especially their financial services brands, because those are the ones that are you know most important to what they want to do in their life. Um, most people think about wealth management or banking when they're doing other things like shopping or going on uh, going on vacation or or life planning. And so, um, when the pandemic hit. Um, what was interesting is, is it accelerated what we've always believed in that, you know, a lot of these businesses were not equipped to, you know, they really needed to reimagine their business if they're going to be successful in the future. And they were very much tethered to legacy systems as well as leg legacy user experience. And what the pandemic did was essentially create greater urgency for many of their clientele who, who may have visited branches or called, um, um, you know, a, an 800 telephone service or what have you in, in, in interacting in the past, they now needed to use digital options because those were the only available. And in some cases, some of the enterprises didn't have uh, an adequate suite of digital options. So it had to accelerate their plans from what they initially thought they had time to, you know, to un unveil over time. And uh, so I think that was one of the biggest takeaways. And now as you've seen people adopt these digital options, they realize how seamless and easy they are to use. And of course, we're still at the very beginning of the transformation. But that's it's interesting you say that, isn't it? I think there was something else that I read and it said um, about the amount of digital transformation that took place in the industry. And 
I wonder whether it's actually digital transformation because these, like you said, these technologies actually already existed, didn't they? It was just kind of, I suppose, the adoption that needed to sort of catch up. So interesting. Um, Chantelle, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I think all of this, everything that happened throughout the pandemic really forced firms to stop and say, okay, we got to accelerate, we got to reprioritize, we've got to reorganize. Um, you know, everything was being done. We we saw for sure that client interaction can be done remotely, um, you know, really quickly. All your retail and commercial interactions, they moved to digital, they moved to apps on your phones. Um, so, you know, really the buying process, like um, he was saying is, it really became frictionless and now everybody's expecting that type of experience so there's kind of like some key impact areas that we see for the future um, as well and that's you know advice and experience is really going to matter now more than ever we all just experienced something across the globe um, you know no one or no place was untouched by it um, and coming out of this you know clients are really going to value that advice and that experience they receive from their wealth managers um, you know, client interactions, they're really going to focus on higher value interventions supported now by digital and automation. You know, digitization's really made it easy for people to switch advisors. Um, so client retention is really imperative right now. Um, but it's also an opportunity for, you know, bringing in new clients, doing some new things, um, really tailoring, you know, things to what our clients are expecting. Um, and, and, you know, really more complex financial lives are really contributing to a higher focus on that holistic um, sort of wealth management picture. Um, and it's really accelerated that wellness agenda, so to speak. And, you know, clients are wanting more from their wealth providers other than just financial services. They're focused on their physical and emotional and social well-beings. See, the way, can I just say, the way that, just listening to David and Chantel, the way that I'm looking at the pandemic is that it was almost this this great exper experiment okay the experiment that we didn't really want to have you know can we operate from home and will the business continue and there i talked to a lot of ceos in my business and there were a lot even in fintechs that didn't trust that things would go well if people work from home they did work well for the financial community they worked very well and it showed, it actually proved, it was a test, it proved that you could work in more remote, flexible ways, and productivity might not actually even go up. So I think that was an eye-opener. I really do believe that's an eye-opener. I think what's happening now, if people are grappling with that and, and thinking, are we going back to work? I talked to executives. Some say we're going back. Some say we're not. We're going to be hybrid. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to watch that space because digital can... Uh, it, you know, can provide a great solution for that. So I think that's one thing. They also, in my view, found out that, you know, investing won't stop, customers are still gonna work, and digital works as, 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 as a way to reach your people. In fact, there are companies that saw their, their growth go up. I talked to FinTechs, their growth went up 100% because of how they did things digitally through social media. A whole new way of recruiting investors that work and works very well. So I found that really interesting. And then the other part of it was it also was this giant stress test, okay, for all of us. I mean, personally, but also uh, professionally, right? It was this stress test. And what did the stress show? Well, I, I can tell you, a lot of organizations were not ready for prime time, right, David? I'm sure you had clients. I work with Microsoft. They were being called 24 seven because things weren't working. They weren't prepared for going digital. They saw the weaknesses in what they were doing. So I thought that was really interesting. And then to add on that is, you know, business continuity and cybersecurity. And they saw, you know, if I go digital, I'm going to have more weaknesses here. I don't have all my systems in place. I'm really not fully prepared. The ones that were fully prepared did well. So I just think that's really interesting. When you I think, think it's such that. a good point that you make because, you know, to, to take the first point and the last point, Lou, that you just made. So the first one about kind of, um, you know, in, uh, enabling kind of internal employees with the, the tools that they need to work remotely. And then the last point about business continuity, they're all in a good place now, but they weren't at the start of the pandemic. 
And, you know, I mean, from your point, Corey, like what, what do you think about kind of, uh, you know, how the pandemic has changed in terms of kind of business enabling the employees, the advisors, for instance, and then how that's going to change moving forward? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking about um, when the others were talking, that a lot of times we think about digital transformation, about that customer experience, which they have. It just wasn't used that much um, because that in-person experience, you know, was always felt this is the best way to, to build and to deepen relationships, um, which that's not ever going to go away. But we've just um, emphasized other things that we didn't think um, would work that well. Texting, chat, uh, you know, this, the, the video chat. So those tools are already there. Um, and as we go down the scales, we talked about the advisor, then of course the operational components, that's where it starts to thin out a little bit in terms of digital transformation or focusing energy and effort on that from an advisor stack, um, swivel chair, logging into all these systems, you know, okay, are all these even VPN eligible? Um, and then as we get down to the operations associates, um, that usually is not thought of about digital transformation. And, the, and, and you're right, Lou, the, the firms that were prepared for this were able to send their people home in days or weeks. And ones that weren't took months um, to get everyone home, um, which you know created some angst in the beginning um, because it was very scary. And this was a, a huge unknown on, on how this is going to pan out. So, so digital transformation needs to go across the ecosystem. And sometimes we focus a lot on that client, which is great, but we kind of forget about all the other pieces that support that client um, for the digital transformation. I think you're totally spot on, Corey. I think, you know, there's all well and good, all the, um, you know, investors having this really fantastic digital experience, logging into portals. And, but then if that experience isn't then continued kind of when they touch the advisor, then when they're having those kind of touch points with the advisor and the conversations, then it's not a total kind of consistent client experience, is it? So, um, well, yeah. Matter of fact, on that, on that, I was talking to Chantel before this meeting and we were talking about total experience. And when you think about it, you have to link it all to get it right. When you talk, yeah. when David talks about frictionless, what does that actually mean? It means you have to have uh, a basically automated digital experience for employees, but also for customers, and they have to be joined up so that you get the full value. And that's the part that people are, I think, are, are moving toward. They were, you know, I think they were already doing more on the customer experience. Pandemic accelerated that, but also accelerated the internal and employee experience. And and the studies that I'm doing right now are showing that there's they're now trying to join it together and get much better at total experience because that's where you get the multiplier effect. Yeah. I don't know if, if the guys have any views on that, David. If you are be interested to know what you or Chantel think. Well, I'll give you, you a, I'll give you a quick example of what, that I think is really cool, and I think it 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 it'll resonate with people because you'll see this this idea of brands being connected regardless of um, of, of what industry you're in uh, and what consumers will expect. So um, many many people may may uh, may know the brand Acorns. It's a it's a robo advisor. Yeah. Essentially, what they do is they round up change. So it's a kind of a, a novel idea around um, around when you purchase something and then your your acorns is linked to your bank account and your credit card and you essentially the the change that's that's produced from any sort of transaction goes into your acorns account which you've which you've uh, predetermined to be in some sort of robo advisor whether it be high growth whether it be value you know you, you can there's all sorts of optionality that you can choose and what's interesting is, so I have a, I have an Acorns account because I just don't like change. <laughs> you know, like other man managers, but I have a, I have an Acorns account because of the change. And one day you I was, like digital change. You just don't like uh, money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, just the thought of like seeing even like when you you know you look at your account statement, it's like you know it's, I don't know it's like the, it's it's probably a weird hang up of my own. But anyway. <laughs> I got an, e an email from Acorns one day, and it was essentially talking about, um, it said, you know, today Nike is going to, uh, for anyone that buys something uh, within the Nike, um, within the Nike e-commerce store, will get 10% off their purchase, and it will be put directly into your Acorns investment account. And there was just one little green button. And it, you know, to, to, to click on. So I click on it. It takes me right because I needed a pair of sneakers for the gym. Right. It takes me right into the Nike e-commerce site. 
and I scan all the sneaker options. I find a pair of sneakers that I like. I buy the pair of sneakers and then automatically, I think the sneakers were like $155 or something. I can't even remember, but then $15 wow. was, $15 was, uh, was distributed into my Unicorns account. And this happened all in one, in a couple clicks. And so I think that's sort of like uh, a good example of, of, of connected brands and where you can, um, where a consumer can, can essentially solve for a lot of different, you know, life, is, you know, life th- you know, issues. I don't want to call it, it's not, this isn't an issue, obviously, but it's more of like an activity that you, that you, you know, where you're leveraging your, your bank account, you're lever- you're getting, uh, you're getting something of value into your, into your, um, Robo advisor, as well as you got a pair of sneakers, because I mean, so it's uh, it was kind of a cool example. Well, the amazing thing is they cost one hundred and fifty five dollars. My sneakers only cost about twenty five. <laughs> that's another story. another story. Well, maybe we should buy Nike stock. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really interesting that you talk about that kind of connected. Um, kind of, you know, I hate, I hate the buzzwords, but, you know, ecosystem, I suppose um, it is, isn't it? Building the, you know, the joining up, this is the, the whole kind of open banking approach. But I suppose it's it's what um, the clients now are kind of perceiving is is valuable. What they want is, is value. And I, um, another report that I read by EY stated that um, wealth management clients are increasingly kind of focused on value and 73% of clients worldwide indicated that wealth managers are successfully delivering value for money. So, you know, this is great um it's, it's really positive and, and it kind of suggests actually that wealth managers have proven that their value um guiding by guiding clients through the disruption um that's obviously been caused by the pandemic and finding all of these little ways to interact with them and connect with them like like the example that you just gave david so i suppose like thinking about that or building on that then you know in your view how do wealth management firms need to um, you know, rethink their strategies and, and the kind of the business models and, and these customer experiences into the future, um, you know, to succeed in this, oh, again, another buzzword, but, you know, in this new world that, that we're entering into. Uh, Chantal, do you want to? Yeah, no, you know, I think there are a lot of things before the pandemic Well, managers were dealing with, you know, shifting client demographics, demand for hyper-personalization, expanded, comp- you know, competition. Um, but really, you know, some of the things that we've seen and some trends that we've really seen is we were talking earlier about, you know, cloud and platform as a service models. You know, if you haven't optimized your operations, you know, you're not going to be able to compete. You've got to be able to move fast. Being agile is critical. Um, you know, you've got a something new that came out of all of this. I think it really promoted that wellness agenda. You know, lifestyle coaching being part of what you're delivering back out to your clients. Um, you know, that has become a big part of it. The digital transformation too, you know, it's really extending beyond digital. Um, and, you know, even there was a study by the Boston Consulting Group, you know, 96% of companies are looking to accelerate the execution of transformation. But, you know, during those projects this year and into next year, you know, almost half of those are focused on automation. So it's back to We've got to be able to move fast. Things move quickly. We can't react. We're going to get left behind. So, you know, it it really sped things up. And then also you see clients, they're really seeking, you know, uh, you know, positive impact. They're investing for reasons, you know, look at all the ESG funds and the movements happening around that. You know, just yesterday, JP Morgan Chase announced they're going to buy op invest in or open invest. Sorry. And they're, you know, really looking to give their clients that highly personalized, um, dynamic values-based portfolios and that experience so that they can, you know, deliver something new to their clients that they're looking to have. So there's a lot of different things I think going on that are, you know, leading them to look at their strategies, rethink them, do some new things in their business models maybe they weren't doing before um, and, and levering, leveraging different groups fintech startups, things like that to execute on that as well. But what you were talking about when you first mentioned cloud and cloud platforms, and I think that's a really important development because that's the foundation for the frictionless world that David and others are talking about, right? It's the ability to have a a cloud foundation, not a, a more cumbersome legacy system that allows you to move very fast. It allows you to to bring ACORN and everyone together, 
So if Salesforce has to be integrated or one of our other clients, Appway, which does onboarding, can be fast integrated, that's the key to fast innovation and to making it frictionless. With, I mean, one of the big lessons from, I think, the pandemic too, is that you know we're working as ecosystems. We're moving into the fourth industrial revolution. It's no longer just one company doing its all with its legacy system. Those days are over. So I think you're right that you have to put that platform in place and you wanna be able to do some quick APIs to layer things in and to build, because if you're gonna to have to move within the next year or two, you're gonna to have to move with partners, I think. And, and would, wouldn't you agree? That's uh, how it's working? Is that what yeah. is that you're finding? Sure. 100%, you know, we've, we've really turned our attention to building integrated API platforms like Unity for our wealth managers. Um, and, you know, just in May of this year, we partnered with NYDIG um, to, you know, really, you know, that was through our venture capital program um, to offer a solution to buy, sell, hold Bitcoin. Um, first one in our industry to do so. So we're really focused on some of those things that are going to allow providers to move quickly, bring in the tools and services that they need to execute and grow and um, really bring value at the end of the day to their end investors and their clients. Yeah, and you, br you brought up the other word, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. That's another very big thing. That uh, That's one to watch. That's a whole new investment. And it's interesting to see not just what the fintechs, but the incumbents are going to be doing around that space. It'd be great to hear what you think about that. Any of anybody on this team? One thing I'd just like to go back to, actually, um, I think it was Lou you mentioned about kind of the, the business model, and we're talking about kind of technologies here, which is really great, and, and building out that kind of ecosystem of different technologies, but. You know, again, going back to that, that thing I said that I read um, a while back that said about the business transformation or the digital transformation that occurred during the pandemic. I don't think it was really technology led, to be honest. What was kind of really transformational was more the ability of, um, you know, everyone in the organization to suddenly come together, all of the different departments and kind of rethink the business models and apply the technology. Um, and I'd like to, um, Corey, what do you think kind of uh, about that? Yeah, earlier you mentioned the word, you know, hyper personalization, and that's what customers expect. And, you know, I think we need to start moving off of this idea that everyone's a star. You know, you're, you're a one or a five or somewhere in between, and you're just like all the others, which isn't true. Um, everyone expects I'm me, and I expect you to treat me like who I am. I'm unique in this situation. My family or, you know, my, my experiences are unique. Um, and, it's it's hard to do, but technology has obviously made that much easier. Like like everything else, technology has driven down costs and, and driven up efficiency, meaning we can do more. Um, and we can even take a a simple use case where um, we start with like client journeys. A lot of times we focus like on that middle part on e signature, generating the account number, online apply. But there's a lot that happens on either side of that that we forget about when we talk about this connected journey where. You understand me. I'm just not a, a random star kind of plopped in through this journey. And it starts with marketing. You know, why are they here? Um, what are they interested in? You know, kicking that all the way in through to the advisor, to the account opening piece. And then as we come back through the other side, it's, it's, it's that the service area has an understanding of who this client is, what their journey is, why are they here? This very connected experience from that very beginning. And even thinking about the product, um, People, whether it's technology or actual investment vehicles on what's working, what isn't, um, what do I need to focus on? You know, is it, is it the app? We're getting a lot of success on the app. So, you know, we should double down on that and continue to focus on that, which all reports back up into the leadership components in terms of how are we doing? How is marketing doing? How are our advisors doing? Um, and that starts to spill into that customer experience like, yeah, you know me. You know me from the beginning to the end, and when I call, you, you understand everything about me. Um, you know, and we get away from this cliche of calling into a large company and you're transferred to another department. And you have to start that whole story over again. That's not what customers expect or what they want. Um, you know, from that standpoint. So that's what I think about. You know, connected journeys and connected ecosystems. It's sometimes we over overplay it in terms of like it's this big massive thing, but we can make it very small and start thinking about these journeys. And a lot of times it's just connecting what we already have um, into a much better, you know, end client experience. So 
it's having a customer centric approach yeah, isn't it exactly. that's exactly what you're saying rather than kind of thinking about it from what are those really great technologies out there that i can implement or i need digital signatures or i need a, a portal whatever yep. taking a step back and actually looking at it from the customer's yeah, but, I, but i think it's a it's a different look at the customer i think the industry for a long time was looking at the customer in a very simplistic way Agreed. i mean they would be thinking about how old are they and how rich are yes. they and yeah. that's how they would bucket them and i think what i'm hearing from corey is that it's it's more than that you need to be thinking about their persona you know and shift that and and thinking beyond that in fact you can't pigeonhole people because of their age and because of their wealth they, they it doesn't just because you're older doesn't mean you don't like digital if you're marketing it's, to women it doesn't need to be pink with a bow around it yeah, exactly and 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 it's not just about women because that's just one cut so yeah. gender's a cut Demographics are cut. Uh, as Corey was saying, lifestyle is a, a cut. If, are you early in your career? Are you building a family? I, I, we found that even education has an impact, the origin of wealth. So I, I think that's where people have to get much more, uh, much better at how they uh, identify their clients. And I think what Corey's saying is that. AI can help you with that hyper personalization approach because AI and other technologies can help you really do that fast and keep track of it, which you would be very hard to do if you're one financial advisor with, you know, 100 clients. So right. the same in that, that EY report, it actually said as well that 49% of uh, investors would actually pay more for an increasingly personalized um, service and, and products and services. We did so, the research for that report, by the way. Yeah. Oh, really? Just oh. so you know. There you okay. go. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this is but I think Chantel wanted to jump in and say something. No, I was just going to say, you know, I, I mean, in our daily lives, no matter where you're shopping, what you're doing, what platform you're on, if you're shopping with Amazon, if you're on Facebook, just that personalization that's helping. Sometimes you don't want it, right? Like it's a little too much, a little too close to home. Right. But I think that as you start looking in the financial services world, you know, I welcome like the more you know me, what I'm trying to achieve, what my goals are, how I'm going to get there, give me new ideas, show me ways to do that faster, better, stronger, so that I can retire, you know, at, you know, 60, I want to be out. So it, you know, just those things and, and being able to leverage AI and, and really get a keen, you know, sense of awareness of who your client is and how you get them to that next level. I think, People are clamoring for it. They want it. They'll pay for it. Like you said, Lucy, they're they're looking to buy that. They're looking to have that experience. So I'd like to unpack this a bit more because I think this is super, super important. And we're really getting down to here kind of data, aren't we? So, um, I mean, David, in, in your view, then, how can how can we, um, you know, we, we, we know, obviously, what the clients want. You know, this is what we're talking about. How can we enable the internal, you know, the advisors and uh, give them the tools that they need? Well, that's where the emerging technologies come in into play because they help the advisors scale their business. Um, you know, if you think about the financial service industry of the past, you know, just uh, commenting on something that we brought up, their, their philosophy was to create products that they think that their consumers want and they build products for scale instead of personalizing them. And now with the advent of emerging technology, with the ability to get more data become more personalized you can create more personalized experiences which what industry should should not be more personalized than your financial services industry and your and your own portfolio and we've seen this with uh, you know people i think there's been a misconception that people don't want to want to be involved in their finances they want to outsource it somewhere else and that's not true i mean you've seen the rise of even robin hood and, and, the, and the retail uh, you know, the transactional flow that goes through that, all the, you know, the, the, um, the Wall Street bets, the Reddit, I mean, people are very interested in their financial lives. And, and, they, and you know, in a lot of cases, if you come to the financial you know, industry to uh, create better avenues of literacy so that, so that people can have the ability to understand their finances better. And I think that's where data comes in. So, Chantel's point, um, and and you can look at something like a Netflix, like that. They they they're a perfect example, right? So they 
they interact with you. And the more they interact with you, the more they learn about you. And then the more they customize those interactions to you. So if you're watching, you, know, you might be somebody that likes to watch love stories and you don't want to watch war movies. Well, you're not, they're not going to show you any more recommendations around war movies. And, and I think that's the, you know, in, in a simple way, that's, that's the model that the financial services industry needs to, to look at as well. And the technology allows you to do that. It allows you to create real time experiences in a, in a very late, in a very late way, very fast. And, and so this is great, David. I think we're kind of now entering into this sort of hybrid, you know, kind of the technology versus sort of human um, approach, aren't we? And I love, you know, you mentioned about financial literacy, and I know Chantel earlier was talking about kind of financial wellness. And I suppose it's, um, you know, how can how can um, firms leverage technology to have that? What the wealth management needs is that real kind of hybrid approach of the two. What, what do you think? What do you guys think about that? Well, generally, I think you. The Netflix example is a great one because it's all about data um, and everyone is willing to give up their data if they get something in return, um, which I think we're learning that our data is actually valuable to us. Right. So I should I should get something out of it like Netflix or or help me retire better and faster, um, which starts to bridge that um, gap You know, earlier about how do I become a wealth coach and a coach? People want to be coached. Um, people want to be involved. Um, you know, the cliche, the best athletes still have coaches, you know, no, you know, no one's figured everything out and can always learn and be better at everything. So that's what they expect out of their advisors, that coaching component. And back with AI, they can do more because the, the number of financial advisors is actually going to shrink over time, but their expectations and clients are going to grow, meaning they need to figure out how to do, you know, more, handle more clients, um, but also bigger expectations that they have. And that's where that AI hyper-personalization comes in um, to help assist with that. But you see, what I think is, when you think about Netflix, Netflix is one of those models in entertainment that could be completely self-directed and digitized. When you think about wealth, the other difference about wealth is that, as David said, you need more personalization. People need, it's not like picking a movie. They actually have to understand how they're gonna live their life manage their budget, go to send their kids to college, invest for retirement. It's very personal and it's it's more complex than watching a movie. So, you know, you they want that personalization. So that's the key thing. That's not going away. So there's always going to be high touch in our, in my view and high tech together, but high tech can make that high touch much more effective. Okay? So now instead of just being having 50 clients that I try to keep track of, I can keep track of 300 because I have the data and I can personalize it better than I could ever do and really understand them and do it not just once every three months, but I can track it from day to day because data and digital is real time. So I think it's, it, I think what's really cool is this kind of robo advisor that can come from all of this. Uh, I still think there might be some that want digital. And I've even seen fintechs that go off and self-serve and they're telling me now they're starting to offer personalized service and even some of the discount houses. So it's really interesting. There will always be a high tech, high touch kind of connection. I think it's getting even closer and more symbiotic. Yeah, 100%. I was on a uh, panel a, uh, a few weeks ago and uh, one of the guys uh, who's from an asset management firm and he said no longer are we going to be measured by AUM, assets under management, it's going to be IUM, information under management. Because <laughs> um, you know that's what everybody's uh, you know striving to kind of achieve right now, they've realized the value is, is in the data. What were you going to say Corey? Yeah I'm sorry, um, that you're 100% right that you know with, with wealth that, that human touch will always be there. This isn't Netflix watching a movie, right? There's no cost to you if you don't like it other than you just wasted some time. Um, but wealth and, and money, it has an emotional attachment and emotional attachment comes with other people. Um, and the technology to your point helps augment that, right? How can I be more effective and efficient with my time with you to continue to create deep emotional bonds with you as, an, as, as the advisor and client? That's, that's what we're driving for. So, you know, flipping through like what we do on our TV, Netflix, like shopping for a portfolio. Will, will that day come like all by itself? You never talk to anybody. I, I'm not sure, but um, 
they would have to get over that emotional attachment with with money and wealth because that's that's the driver of of the human connection and the advisor where i just don't see the death of the human advisor going away anytime soon yeah so they've got the, you know that emotional connection is there and um you know they had that emotional connection in the past with the kind of face to face but you know then we were forced completely onto you know online or digital with the pandemic how do you see that panning out in the future then is you know how much of a mix how are they actually physically going to be building that emotional connection i, I mean obviously we're we're connecting here um i think everyone understands that we could still do business like this but i think we also realize that at some point we need to see each other um there is going to be that component now is it going to be as like intense as it was before you know where you know it was maybe 90% in person and 10% digital. Now it's, you know, basically reversed, but it's going to come back together at some point. Um, but I don't think it's ever going to slide back to that, you know, I made up, made up this ratio, 90, 10 ratio, right? It's, it, we're going to find a landing spot, but it's only because this, again, it's wealth is very emotional. Um, and, and, and building for retirement is very emotional. There's huge consequences for swinging and missing. Um, so, which is very different than flip, you know, turning on the war movie that you thought you would like that you wouldn't. So um, you know, that's. But digital is changing some of the patterns. I have to say, I was just talking to um, the CEO of eToro. And uh, what, what's really interesting is that the new generation, you know, that when, when I, we looked at Wealth 3.0, one of the big innovations David, you'll remember this is the development of mutual funds and the ETFs, you know, State Street and, and spiders. And so that was the great innovation that you can pull your money and, and, and get it. Now the millennials are, are going the, a different way. They're going to active management. They're not doing passive. They're actually active. And that's how they're using Robin Hood and some of these new tools to actively manage to, to take positions, to take positions in companies and positions that might be even contrary to what incumbents are doing and moving the market. And they're moving the market through their activity, which is kind of another interesting theme when you think about it, right? Because there will be some change. It's not all going to be the old way where, okay, give us your money, we'll put it in a pool and we'll do it there. There's going to be a shift. Digital also allows you to get to new forms of alpha, like cryptocurrencies and others. So I'm just curious what you think about that, you know, and those trends. Have you been considering that? Are your about, clients talking about that? About cryptocurrency or about? Yeah, crypto, about the whole move to active, I guess. And, so, and the way that millennials think differently about investing and are actually moving the market. I think you mentioned more Robin kind of emotionally David. when it comes to things like kind of ESG and stuff like yeah. that. I think that that's the other part that happened, too. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's the other part. Well, as I had mentioned earlier, I, I think people are are very interested and and want to be involved in their in their financial wellness, and you're seeing that whether it be in Robin Hood or whether it be them talking to uh, a wealth advisor, um, they want to, especially young people. They're very empowered, but they're not going to accept the status quo. They 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 will look for value, and they want they want it to be proven to them. And, you know, That's right. The the uh, uh, the example you talked about where. Um, they get attached to certain brands and even though that might be contrary to the research on, on Wall Street, they, they own those brands because they, they're emotionally attached to those brands, you know, whether it be, you know, GameStop or, or AMC or some of the, some of the, you know, the mem stocks that, you know, quite frankly have gotten negative analyst ratings, but, you know, the stocks go up because the, the investors are, are attached to the brands. They know the brands, they understand the brands. You know, I, when I look at the, the wealth moving forward, I think that it's going to be a balance. You're going to have to have convergence of the best of both offerings. You want to have, you want to leverage the best of digital, and you also want to leverage the best of that human interaction, that high touch. Uh, just to briefly touch on on digital currencies, digital currencies are really going to enable uh, people to hopefully reduce costs, and again contribute to that frictionless experience that, that everyone's talked about on, on the panel. If you think about it, a rising demographic within the world is around people that are underbanked. You know, they don't have a bank account. 
or they live in what, what do I what we call banking deserts where there's no branches for you know 10 mile radius and, and, and in some of these cases they're in um, you know they're in they're in uh, lower income areas or they're in emerging markets and so those people are are forced to use different types of services to do their their financial services whether it be sending money you know across a border or uh, or cash in the check and what happens is they get gouged by pawn shops or you know you know some sort of wiring institution where they're paying enormous fees to just do simple banking transactions and i think what digital currency and 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 decentralized applications will will hopefully unlock digital wallets will hopefully unlock is the ability for all people to be uh, to have access to fair and 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 equitable op, you know options to do to do their to do whether their banking or their or their financial planning and you know hopefully the financial services industry can also contribute to that as well and create offerings that 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 the gig economy uh, which you know instead of having to wait for their check to to cash three days later. They can have access to their money in real time so that they can pay a bill or like an Uber driver who has to pay for his gas. Well, he doesn't want to wait a week for it. You know, he wants, he needs to have access to capital right away. And this I think is a really good point. Can, uh, I was can, just going to say, Chantel, like in your view, I mean, this is, I love this kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the whole kind of commoditization, I suppose, of wealth management and the fact that it's technology is opening it up to people that, that didn't really have access to it before. And, um, Chantel, then, from your view, how you know, how what are you seeing in terms of that from your clients? Yeah, it's it's what you were just talking about, very much leveling the playing field. Um, you know, it's opening things up where people can engage in a new way. Um, you talked a lot about the client engagement model, what it looks like post pandemic. I think the pandemic also sped everything up. It showed you what you could and couldn't do, and how you can engage in that need and desire to have that interaction. Um, it is there and in person and virtual, um, you know, both play a role in the future. But I do think when you talk about the cryptocurrencies and the digital, you're really getting to the point of where you're opening up the economy, you're opening up financial services, you're expanding it to people that have never had it before. Um, and, you know, we'll, you know, longer term, we're going to have to figure out how we help in service, like you said, you know, that particular market, what does that look like? Is that a growth area? How do we expand into areas like that when you're looking at digital and cryptocurrencies and they're being used in you know, third world countries and opening things up for people that have never had access to financial services before? Um, I think that you've got to, logic I think becomes you, important. What I think you've got to be thinking about, because David's bringing up two points, is digital payments versus cryptocurrencies. Okay, because it's digital payments that's actually driving a lot of innovation because you MPs are in, in Africa, some of the digital payment systems out of China. Matter of fact, I talked to Invesco that has a big sub in, in China and they said the reason that the wealth management got digitized in China was from payment systems. That Alibaba and others started as payment systems with wealth became a natural extension. So digital payment will be bringing in, as you say, more unbanked people and allow more people to invest actually. And, and it's curious that a lot of the financial institutions I talk to see digital payments as core to the way they're gonna be dealing with clients going forward. Cryptocurrency takes it you know, almost to another level, which gives you this kind of very cool investing kind of tool, which I think can be used in multiple ways because it's proving the, the model for blockchain and that can be used in multiple ways by the industry. That's how I see it connecting. Just as we sort of go into the last five minutes, I have to bring this question in from the audience because uh, it's a fantastic point that they're making. And basically they're saying that all of these, uh, you know, the big, large, uh, the large wealth and asset management companies are probably spending more on technology and tools than the likes of Amazon and Netflix. Um, you know, they're buying all of these really fantastic best of breed products and um, deploying all of this really great um, best in class technology. So why basically are they lagging behind you know, Amazon and Facebook, and obviously the likes of Rob, Robin Hood um, is, is kind of the question they're asking. Well, one very simple answer 
is that Amazon started from scratch. These institutions, some of them are 300 years old. So that's a completely different configuration. You have to be fair. Yeah. It comes back to the connectedness it, point, it's, right? It's, the, their incumbents, uh, it's their incumbents trying to retool and do things, everything. You know, it's easier when you're starting with a, a, a clean sheet of paper. The interesting thing, I once talked to the EVP of Schwab, and they said, you know, what these incumbents should do is just throw out the way they have their business, imagine their business as an Amazon, and how they would change it all. But that is very hard and expensive to do. This is why they're acquiring the wealth tech, the wealth tax, right? Exactly, yeah. that's right. But anyway, that's my little short answer. But I'm sure they, unfortunately, uh, they're going to have to figure it out because the Amazons and the WalMarts of the world are going to become banks. Because what's what you're seeing is, is they see that as an opportunity to, uh, you know, of course it's com it's com competition and it's a new a new area for for revenue growth. But more importantly, I think they see that it's not as frictionless as they'd like to see it. And they feel like that's an area where they can disrupt the market. And that's why you have uh, big technology as well as some of these other larger brands creating these in what, what we call embedded finance solutions. That's right. And even if you think about our ecosystem point, I will bet you, first of all, Walmart just teamed up with a fintech. But I bet you dollars to donuts over the next few years, we'll see Amazon or Google, one of these big uh, digital players teaming up at least with a big institution because the challenge is can they really meet all the regulatory requirements sure. so I so at least it's going to be I bet you a partnership and a platform play I would assume yeah and, and I think and, that's where I think that's yeah. where you know firms start looking at their models and they say okay what's the best platform for me to do what I want to do how do I move quickly how am I agile how do I create you know, bringing in those APIs, you know, how do I go to a platform as a service model possibly that allows me to pull in what I need? I can go focus on the growth part and then, you know, I'm pulling in things that are going to help me execute, move, bring thing, bring new things to the market uh, quickly and, and garner some more of that market share. So I think that, you know, as they're looking at it and putting, you know, not just a platform in place, looking at their data structure, pulling everything all under one umbrella and then saying, this is how I'm going to move forward. I'm going to be able to do it faster. I'm going to leverage AI to do those interactions more quickly. Um, I'm going to do them more holistically, but then it also gives me the opportunity to create that hyper personalization as well. So I think that, you know, it, there's a lot of different plays and models that you have to look at and what's going to benefit you the most long in the long run. As we um, enter into the last couple of minutes, this has been, I mean, it just goes so quickly, doesn't it, at the time. Um, I'm going to do a quick fire round with all of you. Um, and I want you to give me just one or two words um, on what you think the the kind of the the, the one thing, if, if, if a wealth or an asset management firm said to you, what, what should I be focusing on? What's the next kind of big thing? Just one or two kind of words. So um, David, do you want to go first? The next big, big thing in wealth management? Yeah. Well, I think it's it's unlocking that personalized data that that's housed in so many siloed databases within within banks and asset managers. As soon as they are able to un, you know unlock that, they can create better experiences for consumers. Absolutely, Corey. Yeah, I, I think it's getting around, uh, your arms around all these systems, all these legacy systems to um, we'll call it like blocking and tackling and, and landing, um, integrating into a single advisor dashboard uh, with your integrated tools and then you're preparing yourself for that next step which david talked about using that data to analyze to make better decisions to to figure out next best action um which gets into that hyper personalization part but sometimes people forget about the boring thing which is we need to land this and get our arms around all of these systems and bring it together first chantelle yeah i think you know really wealth managers want to be able to move quickly on board clients quickly seamlessly create that omni-channel experience across not just what the institution is doing but what their employees are engaged with and then their end customer their clients their investors um so you know having that holistic like has been mentioned being able to just execute on that seamlessly so there's one experience that everybody's you know able to take a part of and uh, i think they should go into the boardroom and completely think upside down and say to themselves, 
what would our company look like if we were completely a digital company and we were to do become Netflix and Amazon? And where, what would we need humans to do to support that? <laughs> and where would they add value? I would turn it on its head and get some serious thinking going on. I love this. So there you go, there's the messages. So unlock the value in your data, replace your legacy, look at building um, kind of ecosystems and integration, omni-channel customer experience, and turn your whole firm inside out. Easy peasy, <laughs> right guys? Easy for me to say. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody. What a you know, great, great conversation. Um, and it's just been such a pleasure to, to have a bunch of experts in the room. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm just going to uh, say goodbye and, and thank you to the audience as well for joining. And please keep an eye on FinTech B2B Marketing um, because we're going to have another couple of these conversations um, to, to kind of expand on, on the topics a little more. So thank you, guys. Thank um, you. And Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Thank All you. Right. Bye, Paul. Bye.